welcome to the net zero emissions um, workshop. This workshop will be focused on carbon capture and storage projects in Europe. And uh, as we know, uh, to overcome the challenge of climatic and environmental changes, Europe has developed, developed a strategy that will transform the Union into modern, resource effective and competitive economy. And Europe is striving to be the first climate natural continent and the ambition is to reach this uh, goal by, uh, of climate neutrality by 2050. So European Green Deal is, uh, is a plan, is a roadmap that how to make European economy sustainable so that there is no net emissions of greenhouse gases by 2050 and the economic growth is decoupled from the resource use. So reaching this target will, uh, will require actions by all sectors of economy and uh, one of them is decarbonizing of the energy sector. So carbon capture and storage projects will enable decarbonization of industrial emissions and facilitate the removal of CO2 from, from the air. This is the pathway for industrial emissions that have no other low carbon options today. So emissions in these sectors will grow in the next decades without such a solution. But CCS is not uh, the only solution that needs to be deployed. Alongside with CCS, other measures should be employed to reduce uh, emissions and boost efficiency. And uh, to quote Minister of Petroleum and Energy of Norway, Tina Bru, with the long ship project, or long ship CCS project, Norway is planning to cut emissions but not halt uh, development. To give a bit background of what uh, CCS and how it works, so um, as we get power from the gas power stations, CCS, uh, so CO2 carbon dioxide can be kept, will be captured at the gas power stations, and then we get the decarbonized power as a backup to renewables. Renewables are increasingly signif increasing significantly uh, in the recent in the last recent years, but and in the forthcoming years as well, but. It's worth to note that large scale storage of renewable power to cover for demand um, periods of spikes and lows is, uh, is not current, currently feasible. Another reason is uh, production of many industrial products like concrete fertilizer still uh, emits a uh, considerable amount of CO2. So CCS capture will create and uh, enable decarbonization of uh, such industrial clusters. And of course, the future is multicolored and moving from gray to green hydrogen. Uh, we um, and the move to hydrogen as a source for heating and energy replacing natural gas requires large scale hydrogen uh, production. And currently, blue hydrogen creating um, hydrogen from methane and using CCS pathway to capture CO2 emissions as a byproduct is the most practical large scale method. The green hydrogen production using ele electrolysis from renewables will naturally grow. As published by the International Association of Oil and Gas Producers, there are about 30 projects in Europe at various stages of operation, in development and studies. Uh, some, of them, some of them are focused on pure gun capture, others on storage and pure and full chain of operation. Here we will focus on projects that will include the production, uh, full production chain from CO2 capture to transportation and storage. Uh, these are projects or legacy projects in Norway, like Schleipen and Snevit, where the produced CO2 is injected back into the subsurface. Also, the upcoming long ship project with the northern lies at the pathway to collect CO2 emissions from industrial areas and transport to the west coast of Norway and then store deep on the ground in the NCS. On the UK side, these are Akron and um, Northern Endurance Finite projects, which will concentrate on capturing CO2, uh, also capturing from industrial areas and then transportation back into the uh, and stored back in the underground, as well as uh, the production of hydrogen from natural gas. Denmark side is a green, green sand uh, projects and uh, also on the Netherlands side is a post of the Atlas projects where the dust capture of the uh, local, from the local facilities will decarbonize uh, the, uh, these areas. Uh, one, uh, one common point between all these projects is the reuse of existing oil and gas infrastructure to transport and store uh, carbon dioxide deep on the ground. So uh, we have uh, organized this workshop and uh, the workshop will, be, will go over three days. The first day is today. Uh, we'll have the topic on global overview of CCS. The next day will be on May 19th uh, with the reservoir characterization and we'll be looking at the key properties of the stores for CCS. And the third and final day will be uh, dedicated to monitoring and regulatory requirements for CCS, which will take place on the 9th of June. Uh, just a quick overview of this of the program for today and um
Also, I would like to say thanks to the organizers of the, of the uh, workshop, so Shiv Dasgupta, Anthony Price, Gabor Zele, Adriana Sitlai Ramirez, and Fiona Sutherland. And um, we would like, we'd also like to say thanks to SCG for organizing, or SCG European Regional Advisory Committee for organizing the workshop, and to our sponsors that support this workshop. So I, um, I guess I would say you want to have, um, so you would want to have a low level of, com of com compartmentalization and baffling. So you want to not have small pressure buildups for reservoirs. So you'd want to have something that was relatively homogenous or without lots of internal baffling. You want to have good porosities, but maybe not amazing porosities because then you might get really uneven CO2 distribution. So around 20 to 20 to 30 percent porosities, but not super high. Um, you want to you want your your structure to be um, at least 800 meters below red line, if not a kilometer, is probably a bit safer. To make sure that you're in dense phase for the CO2, um, and you need to look at your seal quite carefully. So, if you've got a lot of faulting, um, you might need to do kind of some geomechanical studies early on. Um, but you would really want to look at your seal package and know because if you're going to be um, if you're looking at say an aquifer. And it, you know the seal hasn't been tested. You would want to make sure that you've got a good seal package over the top because you will be increasing pressure in the reservoir when you inject. So you've got to bear that in mind. Um, and if a field is highly depleted, um, like a really highly de 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 depleted gas field, then you might also want to look at the geomechanical situation because if you've um, say you've pulled out loads and loads of gas, um, is it as secure as it was when it was first charged? So um, you know, so that's what I would um, say for the of that sort of first pass screening. Uh, uh, Fiona, uh, this is Shiv. Uh, the question I have is, how would you know, you know you've done geomechanical studies, but how would you know that you will never breach the seal? In other words, you know, you're not going to blow the top uh, of the, the reservoir by pump, putting in too much pressure. Uh, yeah, so you, you, know, you always have to have pressure management, right? So there's only so far you can go. I mean, every company's got its own set of limits in BP. We have like RDOL, we have these limits for injection. So you need to assess your frac pressures and what pressure you can inject up to. Then to take injection volumes beyond that point, you need to start producing brine. So if you're injecting at a rate that's quicker than, um, than uh, natural pressure dissipation for an aquifer, you're going to have to um, do um, active pressure management and stop producing brine down dip to be able to free up pressure for the CO2 injection to continue. Okay, and also how would you know uh, if you have reached the inflection point, which is the spill point, as we call in, in petroleum reservoir, uh, how would uh, you know? Yeah. Um, well, most likely you would know through the through 4D seismic, I would say. That would be your your primary um, method to see where the CO2 is going, is doing 4D seismic. I mean, the only way that the CO2 should, you know, if you inject mid-structure, the only way your CO2 should be down at spill point is if, is if you've got some kind of thief zone, some high perm thief zone that's like poof, taking the CO2 off. Um, you know, because seismic detects very low CO2 saturations, you know, even at 2% CO2 saturation, you start to get a seismic response. You know, there's, it's likely you would see that as long as it was thick enough for the resolution of the seismic that you had. Um, you know, and it's hard, I guess, if you've got small amounts of CO2 going, you know, you wouldn't necessarily see that there was like a lack of volume if it's only a small amount. Um, but yeah, I, I, um, I think seismic would, Seismic would be the easiest way to kind of spot these sort of small, um, naughty bits of CO2 going the wrong places. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Gabor, uh, Christian or um, Bill, would you like also to elaborate on this question? No, I think that uh, Fiona said correctly uh, that the uh, question of detection uh, and you want to get that first shot at it, right? When it first starts to do something that you didn't want it to do, the seismology is probably your best shot. And the question is going to be, uh, and at what resolution level uh, do you do that? Because, um, you know, you want the alarm to go off early, but you don't want a false alarm. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's really the question of detectability. Uh, and you're absolutely correct that a small amount of CO2 goes a long, long way. 
Uh, but it turns out if it's leaking slowly and trickling up along a small little uh, zone, it's going to be a little more difficult to do. So, so yeah, yeah. And that seismology is going to be more expensive than we want to pay. The, 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 the thing about the uh, CO2 monitoring practices that's different in terms of the economics than resource extraction is that uh, when you talk about information in the subsurface and, and resource extraction, you want enough information uh, and at some point you want to say, yeah, the more information I get, the better overall because you know as time goes on i'm able to manage that resource efficiently because i'm continuing the revenue stream co2 management for 100 years means that you're going to be injecting leaving it there and that you don't want to pay anything to do any monitoring because it comes out of your net profits uh and who's going to pay for that monitoring that's a regulator's market and not of a producer's market. So we've got the opposite pressure going on with respect to investment for value of information. And we have to be conscious of that. Right? Yeah. There's a tension there between regulators and operators that we're gonna have to deal with. Yeah, no, I, 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 I would say that, you know, um, especially for our project, what we're trying to do is to find, you know, a good quality monitoring program that will tell us what we need, but, you know, you can't overspec it because everything costs money and it's not the same it's not the same as a as, a, as, a, as an oil project so you know you need to be you know you, you do need to be very careful about what you do and what information it's going to give you you don't need to be doubling tripling up on things that give you the same data um, you want to try and keep it as slim down um, and uh, and efficient as possible uh, it's true it's also it's okay. yeah, please let's go ahead Sorry. Just wanted to um, explain from the completely different perspective uh, when we are targeting uh, abandoned gas fields, because there the situation is quite different. Um, uh, our, our monitoring focus is on, on the first hand is of course at the surface, making sure that there is integrity. Um, and that's of course much easier than, than, than offshore. Uh, you know, the well, the well observations and um, the, the surface facility observations with full surface monitoring, CO2 detection and so forth, because you're onshore. Um, and then in the subsurface, we also will have observation wells and uh, not only in the target reservoir, but also in shallower reservoirs. So we would actually see a response uh, if, if despite the fact that we have proven a containment during, let's say, geological times, we would have some leakage um, that goes goes uh, yeah, basically goes shallow. Um, we would still catch that in, in some of the shallow reservoirs. But uh, at least in the example that we've shown, we have another really competent seals all above these reservoirs. So we have a, a deeper gas reservoir, then shallow oil reservoirs with monitoring wells, and then above that a, a seal. So um, yeah, it's it's a combination of uh, monitoring your your wells, your annular pressures. Uh, having intervention capability um, and um, yeah and uh, overall set yourself up uh, this way to make sure that at least on an annual basis you can uh, you can be confident that you, you that the the, um, the CO2 stays in the ground and then uh, post post uh, abandonment because you know these reservoirs will last for maybe decades but probably not much more than that. In Fiona's case, maybe even longer than that, but, but generally I would argue we, the lifespan is decades. I would argue that the industry has a lot of uh, abandonment experience where we've abandoned uh, plenty of wells around the globe with high CO2, high H2S, and uh, nobody asked about those. And they are all at original pressures. So, so I think uh, with us leaving a certain safety margin in there, uh, either in these aquifers where you sort of potentially can bleed off a little bit of, of water or in our case where we will stay below original reservoir pressures, that should give the ultimate confidence uh, together with continued observation wells after, after injection period that this is a safe business. Okay, I, ha yep. I have two questions. Um, one is to Fiona. So Fiona, how can we effectively capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? What are the effective technologies to capture them, to capture the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? 
And then two, if I plan to um, re-inject carbon dioxide into a depleted field, where do I start from? You know, what are the steps? Where do I start from? Well, so I guess the first point, I mean, at the moment, direct air capture is not really a feasible um, option on any scale. Um, so the only way is to, so what, what we need to, to be able to abate emissions, we need to move all the CO2 production away from, you know, everyone's house has a boiler and emits its own CO2 to mean that all of the CO2 emissions are from one place and then you catch the flue gases and you take it out of there. Once it's in the atmosphere, it's very difficult. So I think most of the CCOS options are looking at that. You know, you want to concentrate all of the CO2 production um, emissions into one place and capture it directly at source. Um, that's that, that's that's where we're going with that. I know there are some direct air capture technologies out there, but they're um, yeah, they're, they're 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 quite small scale. Until, until Elon Musk comes up with some uh, technology yeah. that will uh, to revolutionize everything. But uh, Henry, I, I assume the, your second question was targeted towards me. Uh, the question was a bit general. You said uh, when, you, when you start injecting into a, an, an, into a depleted gas field, where do you start? Uh, you, I'm not sure if I fully interpret, interpret uh, your question correctly, but- That's correct. You, you want to you want to start as late as possible in the in the sense that you want to deplete all your hydrocarbon gases first. But that said, um, the opportunities that we're looking at, um, they they all of them also have a so-called EGR component. That means enhanced gas recovery. So ultimately, um, a bit like enhanced oil recovery. Um, you will still be able to compress and push a low pressure gas to your remaining producers. So if your field has, let's say, an extension of two, three, whatever kilometers, and you're starting injecting CO2 in, let's say, in one area of the field, the expectation is that um, some of that will increase your hydrocarbon gas recovery on the other side. But of course, what will happen over time is that the concentration of CO2 in these producers will increase with time. And at some point that will be quite rapidly. Um, so you want to be prepared for that. Um, but that is a certain additional, let's say, income element towards the, the CCS uh, when it goes into depleted gas fields. But I'm not sure if they have fully answered your question there. So I had a question about uh, uh, that... Uh, what is the status of the CO2 EOR and CO2 storage under the EU CCS directive? So it's a very interesting question because in Hungary, uh, there is uh, uh, several mineral resources, which is uh, based on the, on the uh, uh, special uh, special uh, system where you can uh, get the permit and it, it's called as a concession systems and uh, who has a concession right for uh, producing or exploring and producing uh, hydro hydrocarbons has a right to make uh, EOR or EGR uh, projects at that fields. And uh, there is an incentive in Hungary that the royalty rate for enhanced oil or uh, gas recoveries is, uh, is zero. So it's a very good benefit. But on the other hand, it's not a, a classic uh, CCS project. So if somebody uh, wished to store uh, uh, for a long uh, period uh, hydro, in, in the depleted hydrocarbon fields uh, 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 CO2, it's, it needs a, a different permit. So it's a big question and it's not tested that uh, how we can solve uh, this situation if somebody is the owner of the depleted uh, hydrocarbon fields and somebody else wish to, to store in that fields uh, uh, high, uh, uh, carbon dioxide. So it's uh, need uh, a test 
I hope in the in the future we will see how is it uh, solved the mining authority. But in the other case, in the uh, the mining law and also all of the uh, CCS part, it's uh, under the EU legislation. So if somebody submit a request for uh, permit uh, storing uh, uh, CO2. Uh, the mining authority needs in 30 days send this request to the EU, co EU commissions and the EU commissions uh, will take it in uh, consideration and uh, when the mining authority prepare its uh, draft resolution also it has to uh, submit to the uh, European Commission and uh, the commission will review it, uh, give some uh, 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 advises and the mining authority has to take it into consideration and in the final resolution there will be some uh, uh, major uh, uh, deviation from the uh, EU Commission's uh, advice need to make a very uh, detailed uh, 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 description why the mining authority made a decision different as uh, the EU Commission's uh, advice. But it's uh, not tested, so it's, uh, it's a pure theoretic things at the moment. But uh, I can imagine that in the very near future, as uh, uh, Christian mentioned, that this is uh, one of uh, more ambition as well, to, to use these uh, CCS uh, technologies uh, in, in the Hungarian uh, depleted fields that uh, we will see how the, uh, the authority will give uh, response for these questions. Thank you. Uh, concerning the dust VSP, how do you plan to deploy the dust fiber clamped on the tubing and injection well or in a, in a monitoring well? What about the noise flow in the injector? Yeah, we would put the dust in the injector wells um, and we would it would go down to um, the shoe just above the reservoir. Um, that's where we would put the dust cable into. Um, we're still, um, because we are looking at a subsea concept and we, it's not fully, we have quite a long distance to shore, like our shortest route to shore is about 80 kilometers. So things are probably going to be there, but what we're not sure about is say noise levels, because I know with longer DAS um, distances, the noise levels will increase. And so I'm not sure actually whether we will have to stop injection to do the VSP or whether we'll be able to do it during injection. And it might probably just depend on the noise levels and the frequencies um, of the injection. So um, because we're still sort of waiting on that first pass <laughs> technology level of the distance to shore um, for the subsea wells, um, once we get to that, then we'll then we'll start working through. But um, you know, it seems to be feasible. Um, that's, what, that's, 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 that's the sort of where we've got to. Um, and it would be um, really useful at the beginning because it would give us that really that really clear picture of what's going, you know, where the, you know, where the CO2 is going. Is it all going into all the sandstone or are there some zones where it's going in preferentially? It would give you that sort of initial view as to what the, um, what the relative permeabilities that the CO2 is seeing for different units. And maybe in the light of uh, Bill Gabriel's presentation on the, on the modeling, do you plan or have you performed the modeling whether you will see those effects in the dust uh, data? Uh, well, yeah, it's been done on a um, very sort of um, on more sort of higher level, like more what we've done so far is looking at, oh, if the wells are angled and then you've got the dips, like what is your conal of fold mm. the dust would see at different depths? And so that's sort of the level that we've, that we've got to, but we haven't done... Um, that's something we need to do is like a full um, seismic simulation, um, 4D simulation, and that hasn't been done yet. Right, uh, we, as uh, promised, we go for the Balash. Nimit, you have raised your hand, please. Um, if you unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. So uh, thank you for all the presenters for the great presentation. My question is more about uh, sort of a dilemma here that uh, we want to put the CO2 obviously as deep as possible into deep reservoirs, so they are further away from the atmosphere. On the other hand, if it's in a deep reservoir, it's harder to, uh, it costs more to uh, 
to access it and it's harder to monitor because it just it's deep. Whereas if it's in a shallower reservoir, it's closer to the atmosphere, so there's no chance of uh, escaping perhaps, but it's easier to monitor because it's closer and then it's easier to uh, develop the field. So uh, my question around this one is how do you decide what's the best approach if you have multiple choices and, and what's the one that you would, uh, what uh, reservoir to pick for, for uh, disposal? I'm happy to take that if you maybe give it a start. Um, so you would you would distinguish obviously between a, a sailor, an aquifer, and a depleted field uh, because though they are the the yeah it, it, it's somewhat different. Um, I think Fiona correctly mentioned you want to be below eight nine hundred meters where you, the hydrostatic uh, pressure already uh, for basically compresses the CO2 into such a way that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just as high a density. So from that perspective, it, uh, that is sort of a, a certain minimum depth you want to go to. Um, when it comes to uh, a depleted gas fields, actually, you don't, there, it doesn't matter if you are if you're deeper, because there's no real additional cost for being deeper. Um, and actually, there is a benefit of being deeper because um, from, from two angles. Uh, the first angle is um, uh, you can, uh, if, if it's depleted, the, you, you, um, the CO2 will actually fall into your reservoir. So you, you, you might not even have to pump it. As long as it's cool enough, you can, it actually will simply drop into the reservoir without, without pumping, um, at, at least up to a certain pressure. And, and then we have a certain situation at least in our play in, in our geography in Hungary with a very high uh, geothermal gradient uh, at some point you might even uh, consider that uh, CO2 reservoir for geothermal purposes as well so you can actually uh, use use that in after you've injected this CO2 you can actually use it for geothermal purposes as well so that's a little bit uh, out in 10 15 years to come but um, that is the case in the onshore in the onshore setting and um, yeah, other, other than a minimum depth to get to a certain CO2 density, um, I think the, the other element will be you want to be sure that uh, you have a constant shale above you. And if you're only two, three hundred meters uh, below, um, yeah, I would feel a bit less comfortable uh, from a compaction perspective and so forth. So but I'm happy for anyone else to, to add to, to what I've just said. Any comments from other presenters today? Um, it sounds very, um, com very um, comprehensive reply. OK, cool. Uh, we have another question from uh, Erika Gasperikov. You have raised a hand, please. Um... Uh, yes. Hi, everybody. This is Erika Gasperikova from Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And um, I uh, thank you for the presentation uh, for the CO2 projects or the gas project in Hungary. And I was wondering if you uh, could um, share with us what is a typical monitoring plan uh, to assure that um, you can demonstrate the CO2 space where it is and it doesn't go to drinking uh, water um, aquifers. Yeah, so um, the, the main monitor, so we have two monitoring uh, elements. Um, the, the key monitoring is about the wells and uh, the uh, so-called annulus of the wells, because it's the well, I'm not sure what you know about well technology, but typically a well consists out of different strings. And um, and you can you can ensure that um, and there, and these are cemented to, and, and and hard sort of contently combined with the, with the rock. Um, and if you had any leak path, there they would be typically along those uh, along those uh, sort of metal um, you know these metal barriers. And uh, if if you had some kind of uh, failure, you would actually detect this in your wells first and and you can intervene there so that would be um, that would be on the well side uh, and then on the surface side it's all about um, having detections at surface 
So you could imagine um, a leak at surface and uh, in, the, in the projects that are, for example, explained in Hungary, we have actually um, surface uh, measurement devices that uh, measure CO2 concentration and automatic shutoffs. We have a, um, you know, there are 24 seven uh, people in a control room and they observe this so with automatic triggers, but also with, with, with humans. Um, so from that perspective, uh, we are also um, ensure that. But um, yeah, aquifers, I, I understand that this would be a concern, um, but it, before it ever gets to there, we would there will be several ways on how to detect this. And to intervene, more important not to detect it. I mean, we would intervene and react uh, prior for it to ever happen. Uh, so there are several barri barriers in the well, and even if you would, did, if the first barrier was crossed, then you still have a second and a third barrier where you then intervene and you have a so-called well intervention, and uh, and you you react. What sort of monitoring program do you have for the well, uh, sort of for to get that information and to how, how quickly can you react on what you receive from the well? So um, there are two. So we we would have um, uh, observations in the injection wells, where, you, as I said, you 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 have injection. Uh, you you monitor your um, uh, your casings, and your annulus. But we would also have an um, we would have more than one observation well to monitor the the front of the CO two, where you mo let's say primarily measure CO two temperature and pressure. Gavor, do you want to add something? Uh, yes, uh, so according to the uh, Hungarian legislation, there is a special government decree which uh, has a lot of uh, detailed description about uh, the monitoring uh, uh, activity of uh, CO2 storages. And uh, there is a so-called uh, uh, checklist so who is submitting uh, uh, its request for permit needs to give a very detailed answers for all of the questions which are on the list. And uh, finally, the mining authority can uh, make a decision that it's acceptable or not, or requires uh, some additional uh, monitoring tools. So, uh, but it's, it's really detailed. Uh, uh, monitoring actions, what uh, uh, you have to submit to the to the authority. Uh, thank you. Uh, so let's go to Thomas Franzen. Uh, you have raised your hand. Please unmute yourself. Ask a question. Yeah. Hello. Good evening. This is Thomas. Thomas Franzen from Petronet. Um, uh, thank you very much for this great uh, workshop and all presentation. I really enjoyed it. And uh, taking home, actually being home, but uh, taking home from this that uh, the seismic interpretation, especially also for the NGO mechanics, play a major role yeah, to understand what's going on and how far we can go. But uh, by background, being a reservoir engineer, uh, I would be uh, keen to, to know from you guys uh, what is the actual kind of ratio between when, when we inject CO2 of how much is simply displacement of the current fluid in the reservoir or how much is actually going into solution. Yeah, if we have a saline, uh, let's say a, a, a aquifer water with a certain salinity, how much of CO2 would be going solution? And my question is about can we actually neglect it? Is it just a small portion of two, three, max, maybe 5%? So when we do first studies yeah, of, of quick and dirty analysis, yeah, should we just say we inject the, the dense fluid, the CO2, and we can ignore any physical or chemical process within the reservoir? Is there any experience on that? What the ratio is between simply displaced fluid and how much goes into solution? Who would like to start uh, to? Um, I can keep. I mean, um, I think what we what we understand is that it will be a quite a small amount. We're thinking less than ten percent will go into solution, and the majority of the CO two, um, especially 
in you know the following decades will exist as um, as as a CO2 plume. So the majority of the vast majority of the CO2 will exist as a CO2 plume, and only a small percentage, probably less than ten percent, will go into solution. Um, okay. And I know there's things about this, like mineral trapping, and there's other there's other processes which take which can take a lot longer. And I think there's a bit of there's quite a range on how long that would take. Um, and I'm I'm not really I don't I'm not fully up to date with the modelling there. So well, would that take longer than even uh, the injecting period? Let's say we have a certain capacity and would have injected it. Would it start even we actually close the reservoir again, or would it? Kind of happen during the injection period? Well there, there would be a small amount of dissolution during injection um, but the, the kind of you know because in the end there will be some mineral like full mineral trapping of the CO2 but that's probably a longer time scale but I've seen you know someone's oh it's going to be 100 200 years some of oh no maybe actually 20 30 years but I think there is so there's um I don't really know um I don't I, I don't have a could handle on all the parameters that go into that but but during injection the majority of the co2 especially for our project um within the saline aquifer the majority of the co2 will remain in dense as dense phase co2 um through the injection process and at closure okay thank you so um thank you. i maybe maybe this would be the opportunity to uh to bring up that reference that i was discussing The, uh, can you see my screen all right? Yes, very good. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure that this is the right answer, but if you go back to that uh, that reference, and the reason I bring this up is that uh, it's this kind of question <laughs> that you really want to answer if you can. There are these trapping mechanisms that are mentioned in this paper, and they're categorized, and they have a time scale. And notice that this time scale uh, is you know an exponential scale. So here's the injection time scale. Uh, and that's, you know, like, you know, years, uh, not quite decades, but close. There's trap filling, and once it's filled, it's okay. Then there's the physical trapping, which also includes things like, you know, micro bubbles in the, in the, uh, in the interstitial. The dissolution part, we're talking about a fairly long time frame, but we are talking about thousands of years. And residual CO2 trapping, here's mineralization. We're talking about, you know, like possibly millions of years. But the absorption part can happen right after injection. So, so certain things are happening right away. You're filling the trap and everything is cool. And, but uh, most of the chemistry is happening thousands of years in the future or hundreds. That's the thinking, but that's not necessarily well understood. Uh, those are the models. And I think that it's important for us to... Uh, Figure that one out. Not sure I know the answer, but that's the that's what's in the literature for us to look at. Is that fair? great? Um, let's uh, go back to the QA session, and uh, we have a number of questions there. We'll start with uh, Yusung Park uh, to Fiona Sutherland. What's the expectation with regards to pressure buildup in? Uh, not an endurance uh, partnership. Yeah, so we will um, be building up pressure. So phase one of the project is um, should be fully executable um, under current pressure limits. But once we go to high volumes of CO2, so once we move into future phases and we increase the volume of CO2, we, um, so we don't know exactly what the natural pressure dissipation is gonna be. So there is gonna be, there is a bit of an error bar on how many, is it four years? seven years, you know, but something on that time scale, if we want to ramp up CO2 injection, we will have to actively pressure manage. So we'll have to, we'll have to produce brine at some point if we want to go beyond phase one of the project. Um, so we have, uh, you know, we've already done all the work on uh, fracture pressures and, um, uh, and seal capacity and all of that. So we know how much we can get to. Um, but of course, that will be actively monitored through the, through the project as well. Thank you. And then we have another question from the chat. If uh, I think that was probably for, for Gabor. If the monitoring requirements for Hungary are published and if they are similar to the EU, I guess I think you were answered that question, if I'm not mistaken. Gabor, you're... Um... 
I am here. Yeah. Yeah, so could here. you repeat the question, please? If monitoring requirements for Hungary are published and if they're similar to the EU, use. Yes. So it's in, in Hungary, uh, there is a detailed checklist uh, where you have to give your answers. Obviously, you have a free hand to give a different solution for, for different type of uh, monitoring requirements. And finally, the, the authority will uh, decide that it's, uh, it's enough or not, or require more, or uh, what is uh, his uh, recommendation. So, but definitely all of the questions which are in the law you have to give uh, uh, right answers. Great, uh, thank you very much. Uh, another question came in the chat is, have you modeled anticipated changes in the gravity over time for CCUS? Maybe that question is for, um, for Bill, if you can elaborate on that, whether that is included in the, in the modeling. Yeah, so I could, um, um, I'll jump in just quickly there if I can. Um, I think that question's from Mikhail. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Bill. Um, yeah, that question from, was from Mikhail, I think, in the chat window. I tried to answer that one. Um, uh, and then I've looked at some of the 4D gravity responses, and at least with CO2, uh, the cost isn't very big. So, circumstances around 4D gravity will be very big. But uh, you probably have much more to add to that, and uh, I'll leave it to you. Well, there's a little publication also, Anthony, isn't there, in the Sleep Deer field. They did a uh, gravity survey, uh, and uh, it's, you know, there's, as usual with gravity, there's an ambiguity, but there's a signature. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think, you know, we also looked at gravity, and obviously, yeah, there is a, there is a signature. I think, you know, the... Um, you know, there's also a question about seafloor deformation and density changes, which is all linked. And I think if you're onshore, yeah, if you're onshore project, you can do INSAR, you can, you know, it's quite easy to go out and do an onshore gravity survey. Like it's relatively low cost and you can you can combine it with all the satellite measurements. For offshore, um, you know, to do a seafloor gravity survey is a lot more involved and, you know, and it doesn't obviously give you the depth. And so you, what you're trying to look at there, are you trying to look at containment or conformance? So if you're trying to look at containment, it doesn't really give you, gravity doesn't give you that because it doesn't give you a seafloor, gravity wouldn't give you the depth. So you can't say it's definitely, oh, is that CO2 below your seal? You don't know. Um, if you're looking at conformance, obviously it, it would give you a density and an outline in map view of where there's a density change. Um, but um, would it really give you more than, more than seismic would, would give you it would be only if you were needed to prove saturations that you would probably go to density and I don't think any of the EU regulations really need there's there is no need to actually prove the saturation of the CO2 it's only that the CO2 is, is, is conforming and confined and you don't need to account for the position of every, every single molecule but if you did then obviously you would probably need to incorporate gravity let me add to this. Uh, I think uh, the, the re resolution of gravity would, would probably not really help. I think seismic will always be the superior um, measurement tool for you know, determining CO2 concentration and potentially even pressure. So um, other than, than that, the observation well will give you exact pressure data. So I, I think the the you know, gravity will only be in very specialist circumstances that this will give you any real beneficial data. Yes, there would be a signal, but then what do you do with this? So where do you use it for your decision making? And and I think that link is is pretty tenuous. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, could, yeah. I mean, I, I think obviously if you're in a situation where you've done all your seismic rock properties and actually you don't have a 4D response or you have a very poor 4D response, then of course, then you would, you know, you would need to look for other, for other remote monitoring techniques, and so it could start to come in, um, in a, in in those situations if you're really struggling with actually being able to use 4D seismic. Um, obviously, then gravity is going to become very important, um, potentially. 
Thank you. Uh, I guess gravity can also be used for other measures of the on the subsurface uh, on the sea, sea floor as well. So that's uh, another one. But um, maybe we have. Um, please let's take a question from the chat. Do you have any plan for tornado seafloor deformation, subsidence, or and or density redistribution? If yes, how? I guess that question was to Fiona, but in any of the presenters, uh, please um, elaborate. Well, yeah. So I think I just I just tried to answer that a little bit in the first one. Yeah. So yeah, um, yes. We aren't planning to do seafloor deformation. I think yeah, it's it's something if, if if you're unsure, you can do it so easily. If you're offshore, it's a lot more. It's, it's a lot more difficult. So yeah, you'd have to say, you know, with the cost and the effort required, what is that data providing that other data doesn't provide? You know, what is what what is the unique point of it? And I think, you know, but the onshore and the offshore mo monitoring plans for fields are going to be really quite different because of the cost um, and, the, and the technology. So. Yeah. Uh, great, uh, thank you. So let's uh, take Balash. You have uh, your uh, hand raised. Yes, I, uh, this question is for Christian Wilms. Uh, Christian, you mentioned that uh, geothermal energy and the use of uh, the CO2 or reservoir to produce energy. So can you see it in that somewhere down the line, this uh, geothermal uh, um, energy production will offset the cost of the development of the field? Simple answer is yes. I mean, um, uh, I mean, there are geothermal projects in our, let's say, in our geography with a high geothermal gradient. They're, they're always based on water. Um, but CO2 might be a viable uh, alternative medium for, for this. Um, so the answer is yes. Um, uh, the, the benefit of CO2, it can tackle reservoirs that are uh, lower permeability um, because of its, its, its lower viscosity than water, uh, but it has a, less, um, uh, a lower um, heat capacity. Yeah. But it has some other properties which are favorable. So, um, yes, but uh, as I said, that is uh, 15 years down the line. Right, right. You need first need to have a reservoir that is hot and, and contains CO2. Right, right. Really so Hungary is perfect for this one because of the, In the long high yes. geothermal yeah. Indeed. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's take another question from Denise Furtado on, in the chat. What are the main challenges on monitoring of the injection? What problems do you expect to face and try to mitigate? I'm sure which, uh, who, uh, who this uh, question was addressed to, but uh, if any of the kind of presenters would uh, like to elaborate on that. What are the main challenges in, in monitoring the injection? Um, I guess um, I guess on the second point, um, I think um, you know the sort of challenges during the injection and what you're trying to mitigate. I think that um, there's going to be quite a lot of operations, like kind of detailed operational challenges during injection. So you know you might have halite precipitation, like you know if you're in a saline aquifer, um, you might you know. You know you know, it's, it's all kind of like, are you having to ramp your wells up and down? Are you changing the, the temperature then? Are you letting things drop out? You know, do your do your injection rates drop? Um, so I think there's going to be quite a lot of operational, you know, so you do you have to start treating with various things. Um, so, you know, then, you know, you know, do you have to use MEG? Do you have to use freshwater flushing? You know, I, um, I, I kind of think that that's, that's going to be, there's a lot of the operational challenges. Um, in terms of the monitoring, I guess it's just making sure that you get all the data at the right time um, and that you've got a clear plan in place to how you would, um, you know, what does that mean? Like if you get certain data, what does it actually mean and what do you have to do um, making sure that you react correctly to um, any data because it's probably going to be a lot of anomalous data, you know, non, um, you know it's not clear, I think. It's always maybe, the right maybe. <laughs> I would maybe, maybe like to, to add to what, what Fiona just said. Um, I'm, not, I'm not disputing that there might not be any operational challenges, but in general, um, injecting CO2 should be easier than producing oil and gas, simply because it is a, it is a single, single chemical. And uh, at loss, as long as CO2 does not contain, let's say your CO2 does not contain additional oxygen or even worse water. So if it's completely dehydrated, which is te technically not a challenge, 
um, then it's actually a fairly benign fluid to handle. It is not corrosive. And I've seen in one of the questions in the questions in the, uh, regarding our 88 kilometer pipeline, we operate that. We inject the dry CO2 on, uh, on one side at let's say around about 30 bar. And it comes out after 88 kilometers with 20 something bar. Yeah, um, it doesn't corrode anything. Uh, it's, it's extremely benign. Uh, it's, it's well understood uh, while the, its PVT properties are complex, but it's all very well understood for more than a hundred years. So, so from that perspective, we think handling the operational handling compared to handling oil and gas, either onshore or offshore, I think handling CO2 will be a lot easier compared to oil and gas, simply because it's a simple, simple molecule. Face. Great, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we, um, I'll take the question from Stefano Pan, Pan, uh, Pinto again. So, could you please could you provide some information on the cost of the CCS projects, and uh, maybe we can also elaborate a little bit on the timing of from the planning to execution of these projects and how do you uh, how do you reflect them on uh, the oil and gas uh, projects the timing and the cost of the CS projects. I'm not sure who wants to go first. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so uh, obviously the, 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 the cost profile will, it will be different to uh, this, let's call it very big mega project uh, that Fiona is talking about. And my expectation is that the biggest cost will always be initially in the capturing and, and getting that off the ground that has a huge capex and opex. And then on the injection side, I, I assume, you know, it's, it's well, wells and subsea and then um, the, the ongoing op opex will be rather limited uh, because once it's all installed, it's, it's quite, quite um, relatively easy to handle. Um, but, I would, but I'm happy for her to, to fill in. I don't want to quote any numbers there. Uh, yeah. For us, I can be a bit more specific. I be a bit more specific here is um, also uh, for us in an onshore setting, uh, the largest cost initially will be, let's say, if you're thinking about what we're going to do with a refinery, capturing the CO2 at a refinery. This takes a significant amount of capex and continuous opex because you need energy for this process. So, so this is where a significant cost is in there. Um, and then handling it at the um, at the surface and uh, you know the ongoing operation, yeah, 10 euros per ton, 15, 20, so something along those lines. Uh, uh, I would say clearly below the current ETS price of CO2 in Europe. But um, it's also you know, we, we'll be learning, learning along those as well, because there are lots of, we need to think about this very long term and uh, we'll also have long-term costs with it, long-term operating costs. And um, I, I would say our projects would be a magnitude smaller than what Fiona is talking about. So, so she will, of course, in, 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 in this project, there will be a real benefit from the overall scaling of, of, of operations. I'm happy to, if you want to provide some specific numbers, yeah. I'm happy to, for you to do that. Yeah, no, I mean, so the way that uh, the projects are going to work in the UK is that the generation and capture is sort of one entity and the transportation and storage is a separate entity. And they initially, everything is going to work under kind of government support in somewhere or another. So the generation and capture part was going to, um, especially the, the, the power generation, with, with carbon capture and storage is going to be working under a contract for difference. So that's basically that the UK energy sector um, provides a, um, a guaranteed price um, that allows you, that it has in it enough money to pay for the storage of the CO2. And then the transportation and storage like joint venture company it operates under a regulated asset base which is another government um, sort of system. And then that regulated asset base, basically that says that the, the, the regulator or the government sets um, uh, an allowed kind of profit that you're allowed from that. And the, so the generation and capture pays a fee to the transportation and storage to pay for it. And so that's how the regulated asset base 
translation stories get. So do you have a, can you quote a, 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 a hypothetical fee that you would think would be reasonable in terms um, of So I'm not sure. So, yeah, so because the commercial models from the government are not finalized yet, we don't actually have a number. Um, but what I do know is our project costs a lot of money, right? Because we need to build pipelines. So we we don't have any existing pipelines we can reuse, unfortunately. We're going to have to build a new pipeline. The pipeline from Teesside is 140 kilometers. It's not cheap, um, as you know, hundreds of millions probably, right? To build that pipeline. Each well to drill is going to cost around 40, about 40 million um, pounds. Um, so yeah, the initial outlay for the pipeline and the wells is going to be um, is not insignificant for for the project. Um, uh, yeah, um, and then obviously building everything on shore. So um, there's going to be a new power plant, and then all the CO2 capturing technology as well. Um, so um, yeah, so I mean, I guess you're looking on you know, hundreds of millions of pounds or euros. It doesn't really matter which one. Just hundreds of millions. I mean, that's kind of. Uh, you know, I, I detail what Fiona is saying. I was involved in Saudi Arabia's uh, um, war in one of the fields there, and the gas uh, plant was uh, supposed to capture from the flue gas half a billion cubic feet of gas. I don't know how much it is in cubic meters, but uh, and that was not the issue. The issue was transporting that amount to uh, in, in the north, about 200 kilometers in the north. It was a huge challenge. You know, Saudi Aramco has been very um, uh, experienced in uh, in transporting oil and gas through pipelines, but CO2 transportation in pipeline was a huge challenge um, and because of the PVT properties of, of CO2. And that needs to be uh, addressed when they were doing this. Uh, injection was also a breeze, you know, that was not an issue. Great, uh, thank you very much. We. Um... Uh, we have a couple of uh, some more questions in the chat. So the first one actually partially answered by uh, by Christian from uh, the question from Michael Sassin on on the CO, uh, CO2 and um, pressure of the CO2 and uh, in the line and uh, experience with the using of the old pipeline systems. I guess that's answered. Would you like to elaborate a bit more on that, uh, Christian? I mean, when you when you convert an, an old gas line into a C two transport line, you have to first may have to make a decision: Do you want to um, transport the C two in a dense phase or in a gas phase? And uh, in this particular case, the gas phase was the the right approach, so somewhat lower pressure, um, but would therefore, um, yeah, we don't have any phase changes along the line, um, and we would probably do the same thing again if we were to do something similar in Hungary. Um, but uh, my understanding is that in, in this UK project, they would have to make a different choice because of the distances and, and, and the, the, the magnitude. Um, and um, all it requires is, is um, at the beginning of the pipeline, you have a monitoring system there to ensure no water, no oxygen. Um, and then for, for the rest, it's just all outside cath cathodic protection. So making sure that there's no corrosion from the outside. Um, and with this, uh, you, can, you can operate a pipeline like that for decades. This is, is actually not a, a significant challenge. Uh, the, the corrosion would come from the outside, not from the inside. And that can be different to if you're transporting hydrocarbons where you have maybe a little bit of water in there or have some other nasties in there, let's say H2S or whatever it might be. Uh, where you can have corrosion from the inside. Here, it's it's pretty pretty relatively straightforward. Um, uh, but what, of course, what you need to do is you have pressure integrity and so forth. Yeah. Great, uh, thank you very much, um, Alexander Roth. You have a question. You have a raised uh, hand. Would you like to ask a question? Hello, my name is Alexander Rath from Petrom. Uh, I have a question regarding the Croatian UR CO2 projects. So you said that there is a field which produced since the 1960s. So there, I would assume there are a lot of wells. I think currently I've seen there's more than 70 wells producing. So I would assume there are more than 100 wells in there. 
Uh, and in total, you mentioned that you want to store more than 5 million tons of CO2 or sequestrated. Uh, how do you deal with these old wells on well integrity that you say, they eat this old cement because you, can you be sure that the cements from these old wells are good enough or did you do a study on this? Yeah, so, um, so you, you, you have to do normal professional diligence here in terms of uh, well integrity. So um, we have already, when, when we saw some, some issues, we have abandoned those wells, permanently abandoned wells, and this was done with, with new cement. But the benefit that we have is we have a lot of overburden to play with. So um, in this, this perspective, to ensure long-term uh, containment, uh, we're not overly concerned. But um, initially, we did see we did see in some of the producers when the, the C two elevator we saw uh, some corrosion in the tubing and uh, or so we have even seen some some tubings that were leaking, um, and we we just replaced those with with, with um, higher grade uh, steel. Um, so far, we have not seen any any issues with uh, with cement. Um, but yeah, uh, but that is probably more relevant at the time of abandonment. But also let's keep in mind that um, we are not expecting, um, you know, to have in the end a, um, a CO2 plume there uh, in terms of like a, like a gas cap or so forth. Um, so it will still be in, in a relatively dense phase and uh, likely be abandoned below original, uh, original pressures. So your overburden will still have a higher pressure than your, your field at the time of abandonment. So your pressure in the reservoir is not so much depleted that you're below the supercritical phase, more or less. So you No, no, you are still, you're still, uh, and that for us is actually a challenge to, to, to stay, uh, to stay uh, supercritical. Okay. Great, uh, thank you very much. And we have, uh, we are pretty much uh, finished on timing, but we have two, two more questions in chat, which we will take and then, we, we will finalize. Please, uh, Elin uh, Skirtweitz. Um, yeah, in fact, if the question is for Viona. If there is any monitoring plans for endurance development and uh, what different methods consider different. You've elaborated a little bit on that, uh, Viona, but whether you would like to say a bit more on that? Uh, no, I mean, you know, we've looked at, you know, we've really tried to look at everything, you know, we've looked, we've talked to research consortium, we've, you know, we've looked around and we've tried to evaluate all of the options, of course, because we are moving, you know, the project's going to start in 2025, 2026, so, you know, any technology we need to use needs to be at a readiness level that we can kind of put that into a plan relatively soon, so there are some things which are just a little bit too far in the future for us to, um, um, to, to, um, to, to use, but we've, yeah, so we, you know, we, you know we, we're trying to make the, the base monitoring program to be um, not kind of bloated with tons and tons of monitoring, um, but obviously keeping things in, you know, you, you do want to keep some things in your back pocket as, 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 as contingent monitoring. And obviously there's going to be, we have, there's sort of things we have around, you know, sort of landers, like AUVs flying around the seabed, checking old wells, nothing's going on. And, you know, so they, you know, there's sort of, there's there's quite a lot of aspects to the monitoring and it's something that we're going to be expanding on over the next year, the, um, the, the monitoring program. Great, thank you very much. Um, whether that this, uh, any of the other uh, presenters would like to elaborate on the on the monitoring plans? We will take actually monitoring plans in, the, in, in our last um, days, so I guess we have we will have a, a lot more chance time to discuss this further. We we'll take our last and, question from us. I mean, I just yes? don't know, it's not a question. I just wanted to, uh, you know, uh, clarify what I had mentioned about CO two in the atmosphere and so on. Uh, our world today, our planet, is actually a very hosp hospitable place to live. When this um, the primordial the evolution of the, the, um, uh, the forest took place and this oil and gas were generated and cooked and so on over millions of years. Uh, in, the, in the Carboniferous age, 360 million years ago, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere was 1600 ppm. We are worried about 440 ppm. It was 1600. And of course, there was ammonia and, and sulfur dioxide with that. Uh, as the forests and the trees grew, the atmosphere was scrubbed off of that. 
and we have uh, human life or other life as we know of today. So it was a very inhospitable uh, time when the gas and oil was generated. Now we are in a fairly decent stage and we want to keep it that way. Okay? We don't want to deforest uh, and we do not want to spew more CO2 in the environment uh, to kill the human lives and so on. Uh, very good. And we take another question, for the last question from Rasul Amirov. This is to Bill Abriel. And um, are adjustments made to the digital twin if the, if the, if the developments are, uh, are there uh, and if their observations are, are different from the real reservoir, whether the, the models, I guess, would be updated and uh, this would fit back into the, the loop for... Well, I mean, I think that that's accurate. Now, I did notice that Rasul is no longer with us, and so therefore uh, we can have this conversation, uh, but it doesn't have to necessarily be a long one. Your point, is, his point, which is actually very interesting, is what happens when you've got your digital twin and you've got your field observations and they don't agree? And the answer is your twin is no longer accurate for what's going on in the subsurface. Now that new information is really valuable. So the question is, well, what do you do about it? Uh, I think the first answer, and I think you stated that correctly, is you go back and you change the digital twin and you look at different scenarios until it does fit your observations in the field. So this is the lesson you have learned. Something is going on that you did not anticipate, possibly something you don't want, but something you did not anticipate. That usually has to do with geology, which means that, yeah, your geology model probably isn't perfect. Uh, and so therefore you have to go back and you have to try some different concepts of geology till you find a few that fit. That's why you probably wanna have multiple types of observations to assist you in that. You want to, as uh, reservoir engineers have done that for generations, is you want to get all of the information to agree with your model. So you want the pressure information, you, gravity can assist you here, electromagnetics, uh, you can do that with seismology, uh, but you need to go through those you need to go through those scenarios to get that done. That inversion process is actually fairly complicated, but there are there's some math out there that you can do to say, well, just you know, let's just take the observations and push it back into the machine and find out what it pops out with respect to reliable models. That inversion process is actually very interesting. Now, the real question is gonna be, okay, now you've got a brand new uh, situation on your hands. Did something change here that you want to alter your operation at, right? <clears throat> Hopefully the answer is not too much. But the question is, what are the mitigation effects, right? The, <clears throat> we just go down through a quick list, right? One is, if something is happening that you really, really, really don't want, then you can stop injecting, right? Uh, if it turns out that that's not the only thing that's happening, that your injection is leaked and it's coming up somewhere, then you have mitigation effects for alerting the public, dealing with the issue in the subsurface, et cetera. We don't think these things are gonna happen, but I guess you never know, right? The other thing that you can do, which reservoir engineers have done, is you can change the chemistry, changing the chemistry of the injection materials so that in fact, it starts to match your reservoir conditions in a way that's gonna be mineralogically and geochemically better for you, right? So that is another possibility. The other one is, maybe you're not injecting exactly where you wanna be, right? You're injecting at a bunch of different locations and the ones up top are the ones that are bleeding off and the ones in the bottom are doing fine. So you go back in and you plug off the ones on the top and you have the ones on the bottom. So the other possibility of course, is you could actually uh, you know, change your injection pro profile because things are moving off in one direction, but not another one. So you can put another injector in. So basically reversing the process of what we do with reservoir engineering practices. There are mitigation effects you use. Um, so yeah, you know, we just have to borrow on that uh, and the generations worth of reservoir engineering practices. Thank you, Bill. Right. Thank you everyone. So I just, I just want to, to give a couple of uh, highlights of what's coming next. I, I just want to thank the speakers today, Fiona, Gabor, Christian, and, and Bill. And I hope that you join us in the next uh, two sessions, especially in the third session where we're gonna discuss much more about monitoring. 
And just to give a heads up for the people who are still online, um, this is the agenda for our next day, so on the 19th of May, and it's going to be more technical on the reservoir characterization properties and key elements. And the third session in June is going to be about monitoring. On the chat, there's also a, a comment about a special section that is going to be about CO2 in interpretation. So get the link and submit your papers. And that's my comment. Back to you, Emin. Thank you. Yep, no, thank you very much. I mean, uh, this was a great uh, day and uh, we've been very nice uh, uh, involvement and the very interesting points we have discussed. And we are then uh, looking forward for the next uh, two days of uh, the workshop. Uh, Shiv, um, any uh, final comments? Well, uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank uh, SEG and Lori for arranging this. This was very good. It went uh, very well, like a clockwork. 